Okay, let's do another branch and bound example so that you kind of get uh, some of the nuance of what's going on. We'll be able to move much faster in this example, but uh, we've got a company uh, wanting to build some factories and warehouses in either Fargo or Sioux Falls. Um, we're going to essentially create a decision variable, which is going to be a binary variable um, for each of those decisions of factories in Fargo or Sioux Falls for X1 and 2 and warehouses in Fargo and Sioux Falls for X3 and 4. Each of these uh, decisions has a net present value, which is sort of the value of the, of the investment brought back into current day dollars. And then uh, each of them have a capital uh, requirements. How much money do we have to put up now? Um, probably brought into today's dollars if it's going to be amortized over um, several years. But uh, yeah, the capital requirements for those projects as well. Okay. Uh, the company has $10 million in capital available to spend on these investments. Um, what's sort of the best combination of investments for them? Um, uh, they will only build at most one warehouse, and they will only build a warehouse if they also build a factory in that city. And they want to maximize that net present value. So let's go ahead and formulate a linear program for this um, and think about this. So our decision variables, they're already laid out here uh, for us. And so now let's jump into the objective. We want to maximize... Uh, we'll call it Z, that net present value. Here's the net present value for each of these. Um, since our decision variables are binary variables, um, if it if that binary variable is zero, we don't get the net present value. If it's one, we get all of that net present value. And so that's how we're sort of considering these decisions is all or nothing, yes or no. Um, we can't do sort of part of a factory, okay? And so our objective is going to be 9x1 plus 5x2 plus 6x3 plus 4x4, knowing that some of these will have zero as their value and some of these will have one, um, but kind of the combination of which are zero and which are one is going to be what maximizes this objective. Uh, and then we've got our constraints. Um, first constraint is we've got 10 million of capital available and here's the capital used up by each of those decisions. And so, uh, capital for the X1 investment, uh, it's going to be zero if X1 is zero, but it's going to be 6 million if X1 is one, uh, plus three X2 plus five X3 plus 2x4, essentially reading off these values and multiplying them by their decision variables. So we're incurring that capital uh, cost if we decide to build it. We're not incurring that capital cost if we don't decide, decide to build it. And so these binary variables essentially turn on or turn off that cost. And so the total cost that we spend has to be less than or equal to the capital that we have available. We're doing this in millions of dollars just to kind of keep the numbers easier to write. We don't have to write the all the extra zeros. Okay, so that takes care of this line. Uh, the next thing that we see here is that they'll build at most one warehouse. Warehouses are variables X3 and X4. And so we can say X3 plus X4 uh, at most one of them. So that's going to be less than or equal to one. So uh, when we add up these variables, it's telling us essentially how many warehouses are we building. Um, they're both zero, we'll build zero warehouses. Um, we could build one warehouse, but we're not allowed to have both of them be one. And so this is sort of that mutually exclusive option that we talked about in our tips and tricks. And then the other thing we have is that the they will only build a warehouse if they also already build a factory in that. Uh, city. And so that gives us some uh, contingent decision type uh, ones. And so uh, if we think about it, uh, our X3 is a, one of our warehouse variables, and that's the warehouse in Fargo. And we can only let it be one if uh, the factory
factory in Fargo, which is X1, is already true. And so we're going to say that that's less than or equal to X1. So if X1 is zero, it's going to push down and force X3 to also be zero. Uh, similar with X4 uh, is the warehouse in Sioux Falls is contingent on the factory in Sioux Falls, which is X2. Okay, so those are all of our functional constraints. Uh, we then have the restriction that uh, all of our XI are um, binary variables. So binary kind of combines integer and only being zero or one. So uh, those are all our constraints. Uh, when we relax this problem, uh, we're gonna relax the binary condition. Um, and so that we're gonna let X, uh, each of the X's be continuous variables. We'll have to give them a lower and upper bound of between zero and one um, so that they sort of stay in the range that we'd expect for binary variables, okay? So uh, I'll kind of actually use the code uh, in my notes in the printout rather than switching back and forth to the computer. Um, but we'll also uh, quick take a look at, um, oh yeah, we'll, we'll get to the node diagram as well. So we'll switch back and forth with that as well. So um, this is gonna be node zero and sort of setting that up here. Node zero, we kind of set up the problem. We're gonna let each of those X variables be continuous with lower bound zero, upper bound one. And then here are each of those constraints. Um, solving it out, we get a solution of 0.83 for X one, one, zero, and one. Uh, so not an integer solution, uh, an objective value of 16 and a half and success. So we actually do have feasible solutions. Looking at our node diagram, that's a, that's the node zero with its solution and its uh, objective value of 16.5. We're then going to split on the non-integer variable, which is x1, and we're going to round down to zero, round up to one. Note that for binary variables, if we say less than or equal to zero, it forces x1 to be zero. And if we say x1 is greater than or equal to one, it forces X1 to be one. So that will give us then uh, two nodes. We'll call those node one A and node one B. Uh, and sort of same trick uh, in the code for node node one A. Uh, so solving it out, we'll add essentially an upper bound of zero to the X1 variable. And that will give us this solution, uh, zero, one, zero, one with objective value nine. And we double check that it's a success. And node 1b uh, will get a lower bound of 1. And so that essentially fo uh, forces the x1 variable to be 1. And we get this solution of 1.80.8 um, with an objective value of 16.2. So that then ends up giving us these two solutions. Uh, and that for uh, with their objective values, uh, this one is an integer solution or binary solution in this case. And so the Z value that we've got here, that's going to be our Z star, and that's going to be equal to nine. Okay, so we got our first integer solution. It's our current best. Uh, this one is better than nine. Um, and so we're going to continue to branch on this one. Notice we have two non-integer variables. We could choose either one. It actually doesn't matter of all, at all which of those we choose. Um, I usually just default to choosing the kind of first one. And so uh, I'm going to split on X2, uh, forcing it to be 0 and 1, and that's going to give me node 2A and node 2B. So uh, from there, uh, let's see. Here's node 2A and node 2B. Node 2A uh, gives us a solution of 10.80, objective value 13.8, status success. Node 2B uh, gives us 110.5 uh, with an objective value of 16, status success. And so add that to the diagram. We've got those two values. Notice they're both non-integer variables and they're both better than Z star. Um, so they're both eligible to be split. 
now we don't split on them both simultaneously. It would kind of uh, lead to a bunch of active nodes. And so we don't do that. Um, we just choose one of them to split on. And in this case, there is a difference. We're always going to choose the one with the best upper bound, okay? Because uh, it sort of has the best potential. And we're going to hope that we're actually maybe going to be able to fathom this one with an integer solution that we find from this branch. And so that we won't ever have to branch on this one. But for now, it's eligible to be branched on. It's an active node. Uh, we'd kind of store it as an active node, but we're not going to branch on it yet. So we're going to branch on node 2b. Uh, Non-injure variable is x4. And so we set x4 to 0 and x4 to 1 to get node uh, 3a and 3b. And so let me keep my sheets of paper straight here. OK, so here's node 3a. It gets solution of 1, 1, 0 0.20 with an objective value of 15.2 and status equals success. And node 3b, you can see it's, here's the, the problem from it. Um, but then uh, when we look at the solution and the status though is error. And so node 3b has no feasible solutions. So let's uh, bring that down here. So node 3a, non-integer solution, Z is better than the current best. The current best is still nine. So that's what Z star is. 3B, no feasible solution. We're not going to keep branching on 3B. It's done. Um, so we now have both 2A and 2B, uh, 2A and 3A are both active non-integer solutions. We look at them and compare which one has the better upper bound. 3A has the better upper bound. So we're going to branch on that. We're going to hold on 2A for now. So non-integer variable is x3, and so we're going to branch on that uh, for 0 and 1. Uh, we'll get the output from that. I'm going to actually just hold off on actually showing it, and I'll just kind of scroll down here. Node uh, 4a gives us a solution of 1100 0, 0, with a value of z of 14. Node 4b gives us no feasible solutions. We notice that node 4a is... Uh, an integer solution. And so now we get an updated value of Z star equals 14. Okay. And we'll notice that 14 is better than 13.8. And so that will fathom the 13.8. It will also fathom our previous best. So maybe I'll kind of, I'll zoom out here in a second so you can see it easier. Uh, but it's going to also fathom node 1a. Okay, let me zoom up a little bit. Okay, there's actually no zoom function on this doc cam. You just got to pull pull the camera further away. Um, but that uh, fathoms node 1a. And so Z star is an integer solution. We don't branch on it anymore. It's the current best. And now if we look at all of our terminal nodes, no feasible solution, no feasible solution, this one's now fathomed. We never had to actually branch on it. Uh, and this is an integer solution um, and it turned out to be fathomed. And so um, we're done with the branch and bound. Our best uh, solution is node 4a with a solution of 1100. 0, 0. And if we think about what is that in terms of the original variables, um, x1 was... Uh, I oh, can't find the sheet. Anyways, X1 was build a factory in Fargo. Uh, X2 was build a factory in Sioux Falls and then warehouses in Fargo and Sioux Falls. And so the optimal solution is to build factories in both Fargo and Sioux Falls, but not to build any warehouses. I assume then just purchasing warehouse space at from, from somebody else instead. And so uh, that is the optimal solution in this case. And our branch and bound algorithm had to solve uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine linear programs along the way. Um, but note they each sort of build off each other. And so a uh, smart implementation of branch and bound uh, would do this more efficiently than si solving nine separate problems. Okay. Uh, that's uh, it for this one. Maybe the last thing I'll say is that in practice, um, there's actually some 
clever tricks that um, most mixed integer linear programs uh, use on top of branch and bound. Um, kind of current state of the art is uh, branch and cut and variations on that, uh, where instead of making uh, the cuts uh, sort of as we are sort of um, between values here, they'll sort of make diagonal cuts uh, through the space and are able to do that in a way that sort of cuts down um, the search space faster. Okay, uh, that's it for this video uh, and for branch and bound.